All right, this past Sunday, we started a new sermon series. It's called Love, and this is talking all about Easter and the true love that Jesus shows each of us by going to the cross and dying for us. And I know last week was spring break, so let me give you a quick recap of what we talked about last week. So the main theme of last week, you may have guessed it. It was love, but... We talked about how many of us have different perspectives of what love is. Based on how we've grown up, based on how our family operates, based on how our friendships are, we each view love differently. Maybe some of us, when we think of love, we think of someone who is loyal, who is always there with us, who will never leave us. And then I know there's others of us that when we think of love or hear about love, we have a bad example. We think of our home life that isn't great. We think of a friend that was our best friend that left us and we never talked to them again. And lastly, we discussed about how Jesus offers us a love that will never stop pursuing us, a love so great that he chose to die for you and for me because he loves you. And that is the true example of love that we should all look to and run to. Because there's a lot of love in this world that can come from a lot of different places, but most of that love is probably not going to be permanent, but Jesus's love is. And so that was this past Sunday. And tonight we're gonna get into week number two of our love series. And, you know, as I was preparing this message, I thought to myself, you know, What really defines Jesus's love for us? Like what actually separates the love that Jesus has for us from say, my dad's love for me or my mom's love for me or my friend's love for me. And I landed on this, it's Jesus's forgiveness and how he chooses over and over and over again to forgive us, even when we keep messing up over and over and over again. And as I was thinking about tonight, I thought, man, why do we have a hard time understanding this or running towards Jesus's forgiveness? And I landed on this. You know, most of us in this room know right from wrong. Most of us know, even when we know a decision is wrong, sometimes we still choose to make it because we understand that it may make us feel good for a few minutes. It may help us be seen by others, but we consciously know that, hey, this decision is not the best decision for me to be making. And yet we keep falling to it over and over and over again. And our flesh keeps winning. And we think that this thing is going to bring us satisfaction in our soul and then it never does. And maybe you look back a year later and you realize that the very thing that you thought was gonna bring you joy and hope pushed you farther away from Jesus and maybe even farther away from the people that you love most. We call that sin. Something that pushes us farther away from God and in most cases, farther away from people that we love best. And at some point in this process in your life, you hit what I call rock bottom. When you don't know where to turn and you cannot believe that you would let yourself get to this point. And then we wrestle with this idea that it's clearly my fault that I'm here. I made these choices I chose to do this, that, and the other. I chose to sin, and clearly this has gotten me in a place that I don't want to be. And because we got ourselves there, we think that we have to drag ourselves out. And then the cycle continues. And this is where we as Christians and followers of Jesus get to insert Jesus's forgiveness in our lives when we trust in Jesus as our Lord and Savior, he meets us right where we are. So if you're in this room tonight 
and you think that you have made too many mistakes in your life for Jesus to ever love you. I hope that tonight through God's word, you will leave this place changed and you will see that Jesus forgives you and he loves you. And we're gonna see tonight what Jesus does while he is on the cross and stories that he tells the disciples that all point back to his forgiveness. That's honestly hard for us to understand because his forgiveness is so radical and different from the forgiveness that we may see from others in this life. And so tonight there's two things that I want you to have in your mind as we jump into God's word. The first is a question, it's, is there a love, is there actually a love so great that it can find a way to express forgiveness for anything? Forgiveness for anything. And the next is a statement and a challenge. The challenge for us tonight is truly understanding the magnitude of forgiveness that Jesus offers us. Because the truth is it's out of this world. And so it can be hard for our earthly brains to wrap our minds about all that Jesus is actually offering us day in and day out. And so I hope that that question and that challenge is answered and met as you leave this room tonight. Let's pray. God, your forgiveness changed my life. And so Lord, please tonight, would it change people's lives in this room? God, I've, I've witnessed it. I've witnessed you meeting me when I thought I had nowhere to go. When I stopped going to church and thought that this was my life, so I'll make all my decisions and they have to be right. And you met me in the place where I was then and you're still with me now. And so Lord, please, God, we know your spirit is here. And so Lord, I'm asking that you would use this story of the crucifixion of your son Jesus on this cross to speak to everyone tonight. Students, adults, would everyone in this room leave change because of the radical forgiveness that Jesus offers each of us? God, I pray that your word would just reveal itself in a new way to us, God. If we've read this story before, would we find something new in it tonight? God, would your word truly be living in this room right now? Would it come to life for us, God? We love you. Amen. All right, so we're still talking about Easter. We're still talking about Jesus. And we're talking about when Jesus goes to the cross to die. And first, I have two passages of scripture, but I'm gonna read us one quick verse from 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. Peter was a close friend of Jesus, and he also played a big role in leading the early church. It's on the screen. You can also turn there real quick. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. A crazy truth that Peter drops for us right here. He says, most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other. For love covers a multitude of sins. So Peter here seems to believe that there is a love big enough to cover mistakes, hurts, and wrongs with forgiveness. And he says and challenges us that as Christians, we are supposed to be people who express this kind of love through forgiveness. And of course, it's one thing to just write this down and write about love, but Peter got to experience this love and forgiveness as he walked with Jesus during his ministry. He walked and talked with Jesus. And so as we talk about the crucifixion of Jesus tonight, let's recognize that Peter was watching his friend and leader, Jesus, be executed. That is the perspective of Peter. A man that he walked with, who trusted his life to for decades of his life is being executed right before his eyes. 
And to get this documentation of what happened on the cross, we're now gonna turn to the book of Luke and we'll be in Luke for a while tonight as Luke gives us a great account of what happens when Jesus is on the cross. So setting the stage for us, Jesus wasn't the only person crucified at that time on that day. There were two other people that were crucified with Jesus, one on his left and one on his right. The biggest difference though, is that they were actually criminals and they actually deserved the punishment that they were receiving that day. And in the middle of these two sinners who were being rightfully punished, we see our savior, Jesus. And so our scripture tonight is found in Luke chapter 23. I'm first gonna read verses 32 through 34, and then we'll get into 35 through 43. So. I would ask that tonight, right now, we all stand in honor of God's word. We do this to honor the word of God because we believe it is a living word that he has given us to guide us in this life and ultimately bring us closer to him. So here we go. Luke 23 verses 32 through 34 say this. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, while on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. Students, this is the word of God. You may have a seat. So what do we see there? Very interesting that in Luke's account of Jesus being on the cross, he sets the stage, describes what's going on, and then the first words that Luke gives us that Jesus says is what? Forgive them, for they know not what they do. And immediately we are struck with this challenge and the audacious claim from Jesus as he is in pain on the cross, choking on his own blood, his first words are, yeah, Father, how about you forgive these people? Because they don't know who they're killing. They don't know what they're doing. Would you forgive them right now in this moment? Man, can we just take a second to sit in that and notice how there is no delay in his forgiveness? There is no, ah, yeah, they just put nails in my hands and my feet. Immediately. And students, that's, that's the Jesus that we serve, that we walk with, that we pray to. Immediate forgiveness for the very people that hung him on the cross. And as we move on in this scripture, we move down to 35 through 43. It gets even crazier. It says, the people stood watching and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others, let him save himself if he is God's Messiah the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was written a notice above him, which read, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who was also hung with him hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself. And then the other criminal rebuked him. He said to the other criminal, don't you fear God? He said, since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he turns and talks to Jesus and he says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answers him immediately and says, truly I tell you, 
today, today, you will be with me in paradise. So a criminal hung next to Jesus, who is up there taking the penalty that he rightfully deserves for being a criminal against the law, simply asked Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And then guess what Jesus says? Doesn't say, yeah, I got you. Don't worry about it. It'll happen in the future. Doesn't give him a promise of something to come. He says, today, truly, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. And students, when I look at this, I can't help but think about my life. And I hope that right now you can think about your life and you can think about a moment when you felt tension between you and your soul making a decision. And maybe you weren't hanging on that cross that day with Jesus, but sometimes it feels like it. Sometimes the weight of your sin is crushing you and you think there is no escape. And then maybe you turn to your left and you see Jesus. And he looks at you and says, surely I tell you today. I forgive you today, right now, today. He knew knew this man is going to die within hours. He says, today you will be with me in paradise in heaven. And so we read that in the context and as we take that and apply it to ourselves today, we see that Jesus loves to forgive. He loves to forgive. It's in his nature and it's how he loves. Not a delayed forgiveness or a yeah, come back tomorrow. What's beauty about that is, is what's beautiful about that is, hey, don't you think he knows that you'll probably mess up tomorrow? And he still so faithfully forgives you today. Even knowing what tomorrow may hold, he sits with you in your moment of today and says, yep, I see you, I love you, and I forgive you. He decides to express his love, God's love for all of humanity by giving the most incredible kind of forgiveness this world would ever know. And the truth is, students, at the beginning of my message, I I mentioned that when we hit rock bottom and we have nowhere to turn, I mean, the beautiful thing about Jesus and what's so radical about his love that he has for us is that when we hit that stage in our life, he's not waiting at the top for us to climb out. He's there with us. He's there with us. How do I know that? By his actions. I don't know if y'all know this, but before Jesus goes to the cross, he goes to a garden and he prays to his father in heaven and he asks God. He said, God, you know what, dudes, honestly, if there is any other way, I would greatly appreciate that. Like, can we talk this out? That'd be so cool. And then he goes, but father, will your will be done? And so what does he do? God said, this is the plan. He sticks to the plan. He goes to the cross and he forgives while he's hanging on the cross. In a moment when he is truly 100% human, as God puts the weight of sin and shame on his shoulders, in a moment, you guys know this, when you're angry, when you're in pain, your true colors come out. If we're honest, we may say a cuss word in pain. We may say something that we don't like. Guess what Jesus does? He forgives. He forgives. That is the God that we worship. And so I was thinking of my bottom line tonight, the main point of this evening. It's heavy and it's challenging. It'll probably take time and effort but how Jesus forgives is how we should forgive. How Jesus forgives is how we should forgive. 
And I'm, I'm pretty passionate about this because when we forgive someone, that probably means there's going to be some sort of awkward or confrontational conversation where we walk up to someone and we go, hey, the way you treated me, the way you treated me made me feel like this, that wasn't okay. I've processed this and I still love you. Will you forgive me? That takes intentionality. And honestly, it shows how much you love that person that you would take that step and go to them. But what I'm tired of seeing, I am tired of seeing someone go, I'm sorry. And then the other person goes, it's okay. Where do we get with that? We move on too quickly. And I know that you guys know what it feels like when something happens in a friendship or a friend group, no one talks about it. And then like there's that eerie feeling when you talk to that person or those people and you don't know how to get out of that season of emotion. It's by having that conversation. By telling someone, I forgive you. Or maybe you ask for forgiveness. Maybe instead of saying, I'm sorry, you admit to your fault and you ask them, will you forgive me? It is in my opinion and my belief that the words I forgive you are more powerful than I'm sorry and it's okay. Because I feel like in order to get there, there are some real conversations that need to take place until those words I forgive you are said. And it's so powerful. One of the last things I'll do tonight, I'm gonna to read us some scripture from Matthew 18. It's about 14 verses. And I didn't put it on this screen on purpose because I really want you, honestly, to close your eyes and focus on what Jesus is saying here. This is a parable in the book of Matthew. And man, parables... Honestly, sometimes, man, I, I skim through them because sometimes they can be long. I've read them before and I miss out on what God is trying to teach the disciples and ultimately me as a follower of Jesus, the point is trying to get. So close your eyes and focus on the words of the Lord. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. And then he goes into a story. He says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts for his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay his debt, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt that he owed him. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. He says, be patient with me and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him and canceled the debt and let him go. So the servant that was just forgiven goes out and he finds one of his fellow servants who owed him just a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him just as he did moments ago, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in the man who owed 10,000 gold to this man. And he says, you wicked servant. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed over him to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. Open your eyes now as Jesus ends this, this story, his parable. He says, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you 
unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. So we see that Jesus models this with an example and again emphasizes it before he goes to the cross with the story to his disciples explaining that, man, forgiveness is so important. These numbers at the beginning, the seven times or 77 times, honestly don't mean very much other than Jesus is saying, you're gonna have to forgive way more than you think. Way more than you think. Not seven times, but 77 times, he's getting them ready like, hey, people are probably gonna wrong you in this life. People are probably gonna do things that they mean or don't mean that may get misinterpreted. But I believe, I truly believe that one of the best ways we can show the love of Jesus to other people is by forgiving them. In a world where it's so common just to drop someone when they wrong you, what would happen if you forgive them? That could change your life and it'll probably change theirs too. Guys, on the cross, Jesus showed us God's love and forgiveness. Not just for the people watching that day, but for you and for me today. So as we close this evening, I want us to reflect in our own prayer time before the Lord. And so right now, I ask that you would just hold out your hands like this. Close your eyes and enter into a time before the Lord. And there's two things for two different people that I want us to process right now. For some of you in the room, you are holding on to a grudge against someone and you may never see this person again. It could be an old teacher, an old coach, a distant family member, a friend that you don't talk to anymore. And there is no way for you to walk up in them and ask for forgiveness or forgive them. And so right now before the Lord, ask him to take this from you. Give it to him. Lord, I've been holding this grudge. Lord, it's, it's, it's making me feel an, an unrighteous anger towards this person. God, would you take this from me? I may never see them again. And so I need you to take this from me so I can be free from these thoughts in my mind. And then there's others of you in this room that still think you've messed up too bad. You still think that there's no way that Jesus could actually forgive me from what I've done. And so right now, what I want you to do is I want you to pray to Jesus and ask him to forgive you of that thing on your mind right now. Whatever it is that you keep going to, whatever it is that keeps tripping you up, that you've tried over and over and over again to defeat yourself. Right now, ask Jesus to see you and forgive you to take that burden from you. Ask him to be with you. Lord, I wanna pray for everybody in this room. Leaders, adults, students, we have all had something in our lives that has happened that we can't believe happened. A decision that we made that we're ashamed of making and maybe in this room right now, God, we still feel like, how could it be? 
how could you actually see me and forgive me? And Lord, right now in this moment and in groups tonight, would you make yourself so evident to each soul in this room? Would the very love and forgiveness that we read today in Luke come to life in this room in our minds and in our hearts? Understanding and realizing the radical forgiveness that you have for us. That's never ending and always there. Lord, we thank you. We are thankful that we have these accounts in scripture to see your character and how much you love us. And God, we love you. Amen. All right, two things before we go to group that are mightily important based on tonight's sermon, like actually extremely important. First one, first one, forgiveness is not an excuse to keep sinning. It is clear in scripture that as we become followers of Jesus, we are born again and there should be some change happening in our lives. There should be some different pursuit of different things. And that doesn't mean that we aren't going to mess up again, but it does mean that God wants us to strive to be more like Jesus. And if we keep messing up on the same thing to implement some accountability in our lives to make sure that that thing doesn't keep stumping us. Accountability, people that know what's going on in your life, Forgiveness isn't a free pass to keep making the same or committing the same sin over and over again and just knowing that Jesus is going to forgive you no matter what. That is not how this works. You know why? Because God has more for you. He has more for you. The joy that he has for you is so much greater than that thing that you keep running to. Secondly, also very important, some of these forgiveness steps aren't necessary for everyone. Please hear me out here. Uh, if the person you want to forgive is someone who has hurt you mentally, physically, emotionally, sexually, or anything like that, the best decision for you is to prioritize your safety and to talk to a trusted adult if you haven't already and to not be around that person. We understand that there are certain situations that you should not Go to the person and forgive or ask for forgiveness. In fact, you should probably tell someone about that, either your adult leader or me or Justin, so that we can walk with you in that process, can maybe eventually get to forgiveness, but you are not at that, at that step yet. And there are some steps that you need to be taking to make sure that you are safe and okay, whether mentally or physically. And so if that's you tonight, please tell your group leader or come find me or Justin because we would love to pray for you and be with you as you deal with that and walk through that. That was good. That's all I have. God is good. Okay, God is good. It's great. Um, So as we go to groups tonight, man, Jesus' love is different. It's different. It's better. It's better. It is better than anything you will ever experience. Y'all have a great time at group. Uh, If you are new, come to the front. And leaders, if you served at Freedom Weekend, it was a while ago, I know, and you didn't get a gift, I have a gift for you. It's been a few months, but I have a gift for you. Praise God.